So now what I want to do is I want to give you uh, an independent introduction to uh, epistemic model logic. So now try to still store what I said before in the back of your head, so don't lose it, this intuitions, but uh, forget about them for now. It's also good after a coffee break to start from something. New. So uh, what is this uh, epistemic model logic? I was asked this question uh, yesterday at the dinner. Um, it's something that is supposed to help us formalize uh, interactions between agents that have something to do about the flow of knowledge. And we do, as humans, we do that all the time. We assume, we, we actually act upon our knowledge of other people's mental representations, beliefs. Sometimes we assume that other people are just like us. Sometimes we assume that they are completely opposite uh, when there's uh, clear differences between us. Um, this field is quite prominent in artificial intelligence and in philosophy for different reasons and of course different directions uh, are being explored. I'm interested in both. So applications in artificial intelligence are in multi-agent systems are one and then the interest in formal epistemology is another. And just uh, by way of a short introduction to the problem, I will show you a video. And uh, now how many of you are uh, ga uh, do gaming? in general, like PS3, uh, computer games, um, good. Uh, hi. Uh, so now, yes. Um, sometimes when you play this uh, nice shooting games or um, you have many agents involved in the situation and you have to like sneak and what other agents know is important. And then when you play against non-human players, then you develop certain strategies very often that are very non-human player specific because you know that they are kind of dumb. I mean, they, yeah. So uh, some guys made a parody of that. Um... What a piece of the kingdom. What a king. Those are non-human players. This is you. What's that, Ed? There's someone prowling around here. You hear that? Uh, bird? Bird? You hear that? Huh? Excuse me. There's someone prowling around here. Bird? Must have been a wind. So you see, um, we need some representation of knowledge for the agents, right? I mean, if you want to have sensible <coughs> societies of artificial agents in some ways, especially with information flow, so perhaps not in the, like, like these big evolutionary simulations that you make, you have like a grid and there are like dots eating each other out. But if you have information flow between agents, then it's, uh, it's actually quite essential. So uh, in the next, hopefully, about 15 minutes, I will give you a short introduction to epistemic model logic, and then I will try to connect with this other type of paradigm. And now, what's the point of all this? In both cases, we are talking about knowledge and belief. Like in the case of um, learning, as I described before, learning is supposed to lead to some sort of nice, desirable epistemic states. Like you know, right? I learned, I know. I, I am able to operate, I am able to, to figure things out. Um, it's interesting to see whether this type of uh, learning notions that we have in learning theory, or sorts of paradigms, are actually expressible in some sort of logical paradigms. So how do we do this with model logic? <clears throat> The idea with model logic, especially with this modeling of, uh, of knowledge, is that besides the current state of affairs, so how things actually are, like in this room for instance, there is a number of other possible states of affairs. 
some other possibilities, other uh, situations, other scenarios that perhaps are not actualized and not fulfilled, but they would be possible. So an agent knows a fact phi if it's true in all the possible worlds that she considers. That would be the basic intuition, right? So I consider many, many possibilities for my future, but I know for sure that I will stay in Denmark, right? That's, I'm not sure if it's even true, but that, that could be something, right? Um, that I know. So it's something that is true across my uncertainty range. So for instance, an agent A is walking on the streets uh, in San Francisco on a sunny day. She has no information at all about the weather in London. Thus, in all the worlds that she considers possible, it's sunny in San Francisco. Since the agent has no information about the weather in London, there are worlds she considers possible in which it is sunny in London and others in which it's raining in London. Thus, this agent knows that it's sunny in San Francisco, but she does not know whether it's sunny in London. So intuitively, what we have in such frameworks is that the fewer the possible worlds you have, uh, the less uncertainty and more knowledge, right? So if you don't know, it should blow up your space, which is a little bit weird, because if you think in a normal sense, knowledge should be accumulation of facts. So it's a, it's a different orthogonal way of thinking about it. So we have sunny in both places, sunny in San Francisco, the rain in London, the agent doesn't know which is which, which is the actual world. So if the agent acquires additional information, so learns from a reliable source, it is currently sunny in London, she would no longer cons consider possible worlds in which it is raining in London, which means that she would update her uh, uncertainty range to consist of only one world. So now learning in this paradigm is eliminating possibilities, eliminating possible worlds and converging to something that is more. History of epistemic logic. So uh, we owe this stuff to, again, the 60s. The 60s were a really nice time, I can see, because everything started then. Uh, Jako Hintika, the Finnish philosopher and a logician, uh, he actually proposed uh, to interpret model logic uh, with knowledge and belief. So he proposed a logic uh, in the beginning which actually deals both with the knowledge of, uh, with the concept of knowledge and with the uh, concept of belief. Uh, and he represents those attitudes separately. Here in this lecture, we will actually rarely think about them separately, but we will try to match them together. So um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, logical notation, but this is the language of epistemic model logic. So uh, we are building it up uh, on top of propositional logic. So we have the regular propositional logic, but what we are also allowed to do is that we are allowed to precede any formula with a Ki operator. And uh, Ki is just a symbol, and those I's, they come from a set of agents. And uh, this is a population of agents, usually a finite population. Um, rarely uh, open-ended populations are considered, but uh, it's, it's just a finite set. Uh, and this symbol, it abbreviates just a tautology for convenience. You, you can just forget about it uh, for, for the sake of this um, presentation. In case we are dealing only with one agent in the system, we can omit this i. We can disregard it. We can just say k phi. What do those things mean? k phi will mean I know that phi. What does this mean? Oh, gosh. No. What happened? Perhaps it needs to restart. No, yeah, let's see. So I don't know that phi, this. I know that not phi, this. Yes. So I don't know that I know that that not phi. It actually is the same as saying I consider it possible that phi via our previous metaphor, right? Uh, now, uh, how can we express I don't know whether? So it's not the case that I know phi or not phi, but then it means that I don't know a tautology, right? I, I okay, phi. Yeah, you, there was a proposal in the. Mm -hmm. 
So phi can hold, uh, for instance, right? The, the difference can be that phi can hold, but I will explain it in, in an example. So this, yeah. Yeah, Let's see. Yeah, I would say this, right? I don't know, it's not the case that I know phi. It's not the case that either I know phi or I know not phi. So there is a fixed attitude towards this, yeah? And if we were like in a computationistic That's an interesting question. Yeah, I, I don't know. We would have to think about it. Yeah, uh, on the top of my head right now, it's, yeah. Let's try to make this question specific later, uh, like how. Equivalently, you could say, I don't know that phi, and I don't know that not phi. So this basically tells you that my attitude towards phi is not specified. It's not, it's not a rigid attitude. It, it, it's possible, but I, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, so those are like basic components uh, of the language intuitively, right? Now, uh, what we want is, uh, as usual in logic, we have a language, yeah? Yeah, this was the same the same question. I we will do some model checking, so we will I hopefully see the differences between those. Okay, just a moment. Um, so a possible world model or epistemic model will be a, a set of points, states, and uh, each state will make some propositions true and some false from some domain. Okay, so like we had the San Francisco and London. We had certain uh, facts true in some states and false in the other. This is the spy function that uh, interprets propositions to be true or false at states. And for each agent i, the ki is a binary relation between those states. So we had the question mark between the two scenarios, San Francisco scenarios. This is the relation, the accessibility relation for the agent. So the agent cannot distinguish between those two. She doesn't have enough information to say which is the actual world. And now a pointed possible world model is a pair of this structure together with one state being distinguished as a special one. Yeah? One that is um, uh, considered to be the actual state. The agents might not know which it is, but we as modelers know that. Is this definition clear? The questions, any questions? I'm trying to explain it also intuitively, but um, this would be the formal way to put it together. So again, phi of s tells us whether a proposition is true or false in a state s, and ki captures the possibility relation according the, to the agent i. So a pair of states is in this relation if agent i considers world t possible given her information in the world s, and vice versa. In our case, it will be the same. Ki is a possibility or accessibility relation. It says what worlds agent i considers possible or can access in any given world. Um, One more technical slide, yeah? That's like uh, the ki is an open interpretation. If I, if I know s, then I consider t not possible. I would not make this uh, connection at this moment. I think it's uh, harmful to make this uh, connection because what we want is we are uh, talking now purely on the semantic level. It's a graph. There are two states. They represent possible states of the world and they're connected with an edge which corresponds to the fact that the agent does cannot distinguish between those two, okay? And of course, there will be certain logical consequences of it, but they will be on a higher level. It's, it's not as simple as implication. But just trust me for now. We will, I, I hope it will become... Um, now, one more technical slide. This relation between those worlds, in this case, will be assumed to be equivalence relation. So the agent doesn't know whether it's uh, sunny in London or not, but she doesn't prefer any of those worlds. They are just equally plausible. There is no hint, no evidence, nothing that uh, makes her prefer one or the other. Then we would say that such a relation is an equivalence if it's reflexive. So agents considers each world possible in this world. So if I am in a certain state of affairs, I consider it possible that this is actually the state of affairs. So I have some sort of introspection about where I am. Symmetric. If from one world I consider another world possible, then I also consider it the other way around. So they are kind of the same value. And transitive. If I can consider from one state the next state and then another state, then I directly from the first state consider the third state to be the case. Okay. 
So now what we do is that we can uh, simply interpret this logical language that we had before on these structures, on these graphs. Right? So we can say that certain formulas of our language, like the ki phi, they hold at a state in a model or not. Right? And this is the semantics of our framework. So we take a model and a state in our model, and we say that p is satisfied at the state if and only if our valuation function makes it true in the state, right? as we had it before in the specification of the model. This goes exactly the same as propositional logic, and now the knowledge operator will tell you that at the state, uh, at the model M, at the state S, agent I knows that phi, if for all states that are accessible from the previous state, from the state that we consider to be the one, phi holds. Right? So it's a bit like interpreting some sort of logic of graphs, right? So all of those are interpreted only on the, in this particular nodes, while this formula, it reaches out. It's a modality. It reaches out to the next world. So its truth value in a certain world depends on what is in the other states. If you're familiar with temporal logic or with all sorts of logics interpreted of graphs, then you should know that sometimes the truth value of such formulas depends on other states. Yeah. Just to clarify, it's um, literally KI, mm -hmm. they are um, part of the model, right? So you, you, yeah. you fix them yeah. externally, yes. they're not part of the model. Yeah. No. Okay. That's kind of a main task of the modeler to figure them out. Uh, we, will, we will do it. There was another question? No? Yeah? Sorry, I was stretching. Ah, oh, stretching. Okay. That's also important. Um, okay, so is it sunny in San Francisco? So now we have two agents. Um, this is sunny in San Francisco. P stands for sunny in San Francisco. So um, in this state, agent one considers it's possible that it's actually not sunny in San Francisco. Right? So the agent, agent one does not know. Right? Now agent two actually knows that it's sunny in San Francisco. Because it's for, for both uh, worlds that are accessible to him, uh, it's sunny in San Francisco. And we have this reflexive arrows because we assume the relation to be reflexive. OK, let's see if we can model check this stuff. So is it true that uh, P, uh, that it's sunny in San Francisco? Uh, and let's assume that we are evaluating in S now. Yes. Right, because P is simply made true. Uh, is it true that agent one doesn't know that it's sunny in San Francisco? Right? So in, uh, in the state S, agent one knows, uh, actually it is sunny in San Francisco, but agent uh, one um, also has the accessibility relation towards a world which makes this formula false. Right? So considers it's possible that it's not sunny in San Francisco. Uh, here I specify where I want you to evaluate. And, and is that you can say so. Yeah, that would be the this would be the pointed uh, epistemic model. Yeah. So I'm trying to avoid uh, putting it in the picture because I would like to switch from world to world. So now we are evaluating at world U. Does agent one know that P? Who thinks it does? Who thinks it doesn't? Um, okay. Um, and the rest? What the, does the rest think? <laughs> it's a third, uh, three valued logic we have here. Uh, okay, so um, let's see. This was supposed to be uh, wherever I go from you with the accessibility uh, relation of agent one, P will hold. So I meet you, wherever I go with the accessibility relation for agent one, P will hold. Yeah. So in this world, agent knows that. Uh, let's try uh, agent two. Does he know that P in uh, state S? Yes. yes, because wherever he goes, P is true. Now, does the agent one know that agent two knows P or agent two does not know P? And this was the knowing whether, right? Is it the case that agent one knows that the other agent has this knowledge? Hmm? 
If it's a tautology, it would be true under any circumstances. And maybe sometimes the agent too might not know, and then this would be a point. Um, okie doke, uh, let's see. So uh, our semantics allows us to actually stop thinking in terms of this very confusing stuff about knowledge, but just think about the graph, right? So semantically, this would mean that in the state S, wherever I go with the relation one, so I can go here or here, so in those two worlds, what you have to model check is this formula, right? So this part has to be checked here and here. So let's see, is this formula true here? Because of the first component, right? The, he knows that. And is it, uh, is, uh, is it true here? Yes. So, Well, that's the thing, right? That intuitively, perhaps you would like this graph to look different because of what you think knowledge is. But we, so far, we just build up the semantics on the basic intuition that knowledge is the accessibility of the states from a given state, right? And then this modeling just follows that basic intuition, and then you can interpret such formulas in this way. You can still disagree intuitively, right? But this is the consequence of what we agreed on how to interpret uncertainty. Are there any questions about that? How many of you saw this before? Okay, good. The final example. It's not the case that agent two knows that agent one doesn't know that P. Yeah, so again, we have to check at the state S whether there is a, a accessible possible word for agent two in which the negation of it is true. Okay, I will leave it as an exercise. You can maybe um, go through the graph uh, by yourself. The most standard thing that you always hear when you talk about epistemic logic is muddy children. So those of you, I mean, there's quite a number of people that never saw it, so let's go through this. There's a famous puzzle. And the puzzle actually illustrates that sometimes there is a knowledge in the system, there's information in the system that is accessible that is very difficult to see from the level of description, but it's easier to um, really uh, analyze in terms of this graph uh, properties. So imagine and children are playing outside together. Now it happens that during their play, some of them, say K of this N, smaller than N, uh, get, uh, or equal, <laughs> get mud on their foreheads. Uh, each can see mud on others, but not on their own forehead. So you see other kids' foreheads, but not your own, obviously. And you don't have a mirror, uh, you're just, yeah. Along comes the father and says, at least one of you have mud on your forehead. The father then asks the following question over and over. Does any of you know whether you have mud on your forehead? On your own forehead. Uh, assuming that all the children are perceptive, intelligent, and truthful, and they answer simultaneously what will happen. And now, surprisingly, if you run this uh, in our framework, after the father asks the question for the kth time, where k is the number of muddy children, all the muddy children will be able to say yes. We know. Even though, like on a surface level, this is a question, the same question being repeated over and over again in the same way, right? So, like, it should not carry more information, like, on the syntactic level. And uh, this puzzle was successfully modeled with, um, with uh, epistemic logic under the following assumptions. So first of all, there is common knowledge between agents. So agents know, all of them know, and all of them know that they know, that they know, that they know, and so on. Uh, that the father is truthful, uh, that all the children hear the father, that all uh, the children see each other, that none of them can see their own forehead, and that all the children are truthful and intelligent, 
and actually they're perfect logical reasoners on top of that. So those are really freaky kids, like uh, you don't see them so much. Um, this is the epistemic logic modeling of this uh, situation. So um, if we start with complete uncertainty, we have all possibilities. So all the kids, uh, let's say we have three kids, three, A, B, C, and all of them are muddy. Here, all of them are non-muddy, so not M, A means A is not muddy, and there are all the other possibilities, right? Eight of them to the, to the third. Now, uh, should I draw some uh, accessibility relations for agents? Could you figure out, for instance, how to connect W1 with other words? So in W1, we have that um, all of them are muddy, and in W3, for instance, we have that A and B is muddy, but C is not muddy. Are those two worlds in an accessibility relation for any of the agents? Why? He, got, he doesn't see his own forehead, right? Uh, so, yeah. Ha. Huh. I thought maybe it will go the other way, but it went there. So, C. Right? And in the same way, we can actually draw the rest of this model. Right? So, this is how the situation looks. Uh, kind of from the perspective of uncertainty, how agents actually think about each other. And it's not only the uncertainty of separate agents taken in isolation, but it's also uncertainty of what I know about other agents knowing. Okay, so since I have uncertainty and I see two guys uh, in the same situation as me, I can also reason about what they don't know. Right? So I know what they don't know and I don't know, yeah, you know what I mean. So before the announcement, this is what it looks like, right? We have these guys and they, they kind of, they are logical, ideal logical kids, so they should be able to have this in their heads. So this is before the announcement. Now the father comes and says, one of you has mud on your forehead. So he says, at least one of you, he says uh, MA or MB or MC, right, in, in logic. What should happen? We talked a little bit about learning and eliminating possibilities, right? What should happen to the model? Yeah, WH should die. And it should die because it's an announcement that is made to all the kids simultaneously and they all hear that others hear, right? So they, all of them can eliminate this world from their uncertainties. Poof, right? Okay, and now he asks, does any of you know if you're muddy or not? This is one of those things that will repeat. And they say no. Is there anything that we can infer on this for this model? Yeah, so intuitively what we see here is that uh, we have uh, this world says uh, A is muddy, but the two of the other agents are not, right? But the, the, the father said uh, one of you is muddy. So if I am the muddy kid and I see two non-muddy kids, I know that I am the muddy one, right? So this is on the level of intuitions, but on the level of the modeling, simply there is no outgoing edge, as you say, for uh, agent A. So agent A should know something there, but he refuses to say Right? And the same for all of those. Right? So those guys also disappear. Right? And now we have, does any of you know? Again, no, and similar situation. It's just an iterated model. So this time it should be two guys. But this is the tricky point, where actually human subjects fail to reason. We, we, are un we as human beings are very bad at uh, such reasonings um, about knowledge. And finally, those uh, possibilities are eliminated, and we are left with one possibility. Okay, so now uh, this is a particular type of, yeah. And they all know. They all have mud on their forehead and they all know that they have mud on their forehead, <laughs> which is like the worst possible scenario. <laughs> <laughs> because all the uncertainty was eliminated through the process, right? So the only thing that they consider is the actual. Could it not happen that child A didn't have mud on his forehead? We would have seen it before. So if it was the case, then somebody would announce something before. 
I have to go on, but let's talk about this later. We can, uh, sometimes I play it with the students in class and then, it, uh, not with mud, but with some uh, motivations. Uh, so now briefly, uh, how to make it from like some sort of puzzle play into something serious, concrete, right? What is it that we are doing here? What are the implications of such understanding of knowledge? Uh, one way to look at it is to look, go through axiomatizations. So see what are the validities that include this K operators that will be always true in such frameworks. And um, uh, then the question is for AI and for other purposes, how well does such operator model certain phenomena in certain contexts? How computationally feasible it is? Can we implement it on robots? You saw how big this structure is, right? I mean, it's an exponential structure with respect to the uh, number of agents. So it will very often be quite costly, but people are trying to find ways around it. Um, so we will try to answer this question by looking at formulas about knowledge that are always true. Right, and this is what we call validity in logic. And those slides are for those of you who want to catch up because it should be quite well known what validity means. Basically formulas that are guaranteed to be true under certain circumstances. Okay, so uh, it will be always a little bit axiomatic. So for instance, about our type of knowledge that we discussed so far, we can show the following things. This is always true. If an agent knows that phi, and an agent knows that phi implies psi, then agent knows that psi. On the level of logic, great. On the level of human subjects, not so great. Because this is a closure on consequence. This means that an agent always knows all the logical consequences of what they know. Right? Tricky. I mean, abstractly perhaps, but in practice, not really. Knowledge generalization rule. For all models, it's the case that if phi is valid, if it's a tautology or if it's just a valid formula, then agent knows it. So again, whatever is uh, valid, we are able to know it. Right? So tautologies will be known. Again, abstractly speaking, great. Human subjects, not so much. Agents can know only facts. Right? So if I know that phi, then phi holds. We can postulate this about natural language. This is how we use knowledge. But in fact, we use the knowledge operators in natural language in weird ways. I mean, I'm sure uh, uh, people believed all sorts of things that they know them uh, before, for instance, Copernicus or, yeah. Um, agents know what they know and what they don't know. So positive and negative introspection. If I know that phi, I know that I know that phi. And if I don't know that phi, then I know that I don't know that phi. Right? And those are things that can be actually shown on the level of modal logic about this interpretation of knowledge. Okay, so if we agree on this uh, modeling, then we actually have to accept that this will be what will be true about our knowledge modeling. So this is what we call S5 systems, and probably those of you who are a bit philosophically inclined, you probably hear this from time to time in formal epistemology workshops, S5 knowledge. S5 knowledge basically means that it's knowledge interpreted over uh, equivalence relation graphs, and uh, this will be the uh, sets of axioms that will be satisfied uh, about this knowledge. And this type of knowledge corresponds to full certainty. I'm, I'm certain, I know what I know, I know what I don't know, uh, my knowledge is factual, so whatever I know is true, and so on. So it's like this really ideal uh, postulated type of knowledge. Now, uh, when you try to show these things, that they indeed hold of our graphs, then you discover that you are in the proof using the reflexivity relation, the transitivity relation, and the symmetricity and transitivity relation in this case. So the natural question is whether if we drop certain assumptions about the accessibility relation between... Um, the states in our model, then we will probably lose some of those actions. Right? And uh, then this is a bunch of results. So model logicians work on this all the time. They are trying to find the formal uh, relationship on these uh, graphs. They don't have to be interpreted as knowledge, but they are interpreted in the same way as, uh, as we had here. And now the class of models can satisfy different properties of the accessibility relation, and then it results in different uh, 
types of modal logics. How many of you are familiar with different types of modal logic? So this will be just, those are different logics with different selections of axioms that are being satisfied or not. Okay? Um, and now some of them are of epistemic usefulness, some of the use, some of them are not. Uh, some of them are good for uh, time modeling, branching time modeling. Some of them are good for belief modeling where you have an order instead of um, a state. And if you want to know more, you should look into this book. Um, and uh, perhaps uh, consider looking into Ida Venema's work. Maybe. Um, there is also a dynamic version of uh, epistemic logic in which we are trying to model uh, the dynamics of the language directly in the language. So you saw before uh, that we actually updated the model with the incoming information of the father right, step by step. Now we can have these elements of the announcements directly in the logical language. And this is where we introduce these dynamic modalities that allow to talk about after a certain action being performed, for instance an announcement, then certain formulas become true. So we can talk about dynamic changes in the model starting in the static case in the initial model. Right? So we, for instance, for Maddie Children, we could say something like, after this many announcement, this type of announcement, a certain formula will become true over time. Right? And formally, what we simply do is that we actually just add an extra operator, a dynamic operator. In this case, it will be the public announcement uh, logic operator uh, that says that uh, after a certain announcement of a formula, another formula will work, will, uh, will, will be true. Uh, an extension, this is called public announcement logic. So again, uh, simply, again, this eliminative type of learning in which uh, announcing a certain formula makes us eliminate possibilities. Um, and the semantics of it will go again in the same way as before. So we will interpret knowledge in the same way, except this new operator that will basically tell you that if a formula was true in the starting state in the beginning, then after updating, after cutting the model, removing all the um, formulas that don't satisfy phi, psi will be true in the model. Right? So we are kind of, with this modality, we are looking forward in time in a way, right? Not only for the model. Yeah? Simplifyingly speaking. It's just a symbol that it's a public announcement, it's like shouting, you know. Uh, but um, this is how it customarily came to be. Um. Okay. There is also a nice generalization of this because this is just one particular epistemic action. It's an epistemic action because it does not influence the mud on children's foreheads. It influences epistemic states of the agents. And so what they know, it does not, if you like look at the surface, there's nothing changing. It's just an announcement. So it, it does something to people's heads. Uh, this is just one type public announcement, but you can consider all sorts of uh, public, uh, all sorts of epistemic events that are not public announcements, or there could be private announcements. There could be uh, some secrets, gossip. Uh, there could be all sorts of epistemic action that don't involve all agents at the same time. And even you can have uh, situations in which uh, the action does not cut the epistemic states, but it actually makes it even bigger. So it introduces more uncertainty. For instance, we have an epistemic model with a coin heads up on the table. Now I come to this table, I take the coin, I put it in a cup, I shake, and I toss, and I leave the cup on top of the coin. Right? Now the, your new epistemic state has to transform from this epistemic state to a state in which you don't know whether the head is tails or heads up. Right? So in dynamic epistemic logic, what we postulate is that you can actually ep represent epistemic actions as action models. So actions can have their own internal structure. And then this is what we call product update that takes a starting uh, graph or the starting Kripke structure possible world <laughs> model. We multiply each state by this event and we get a new epistemic state. So here we have unconditionally performed event which turns the heads up 
and which turns the heads down. So it's either heads or tails. And as a result, through this easy procedure, we get a new epistemic model, which consists of two states uh, with an indistinguishability agent for the agent. So the idea here is that dynamic epistemology can be extended to cover much larger types of uh, events that have internal epistemic structure for the agents. And here is some uh, references if you're interested in, in this part. So now to see more, I encourage you to perhaps look into this book, but uh, is it clear? Dynamic epistemic logic. Um, uh, there we have a lot of examples and really nice cases of uh, this treatment. So this is now the end of part one. If you have any questions at this point. No? Uh, I have a question. Um, can you put this into uh, or say what, like, are other applications of this, or is this more like an academic exercise? No, you can look into um, all conferences in artificial intelligence nowadays, and they have a separate tracks on epistemic uh, modeling of robot. It's mostly uh, consists of uh, looking into how to represent knowledge of other agents in uh, social situations between robots, for instance. And also it has use in cognitive science nowadays. And people are trying to, exp uh, to uh, model um, uh, the idea that we as humans uh, are actually able to cooperate in the context of assuming other agents' knowledge and beliefs. It's called theory of mind or mirror, ne mirror neurons, things like this. Um, of course, academic exercise. Hmm. It is an academic exercise as well. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a bad thing. Yes, uh, there is actually a, a paper also by uh, the same <coughs> bunch of authors on uh, private suspicions and uh, more complex epistemic protocols. And actually, uh, here uh, Sophia Knight was mentioned in this context, right, with epistemic protocols uh, that would be put. Uh, Okay, so now I will try to connect, yeah. Uh, do you have these S5 uh, axes referred to this from, uh, um, if you say that uh, knowledge is only the subject that is really also computable, does all of this go down or? No, this is, down? this is all computable. It's just uh, hard to compute sometimes because uh, you have uh, exponential sizes of models. Time computable. I mean, people try to reduce the complexity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because there are finitely many agents and finitely many propositions in applications. Actually, in the work that I will show you now, we assume to have infinitely many states. Sometimes, to make it significant. Yeah. Well, not so, no. Well, uh, there are modifications of the system, yeah. But. Uh, I thought that it's to be Yeah. Um, I don't know. Andres, do you know anything about it? No. It would be a little bit challenging because it actually questions the kind of uh, root of, of model logic in a way. Most of them. But on the other hand, of course, people try to cope with logical omniscience in agents in all sorts of ways, right? So trying, for instance, to restrict the size of the proofs, saying that you're, you're, you have distributivity, but you cannot go arbitrary long because you have limited memory, so you cannot make arbitrary long proofs, right? So that's what people are trying to do. Okay, let's continue now. Um, yeah? Yeah, um, I think it will actually heavily depend on the context and uh, uh, some of this context dependent aspects can be actually expressed uh, by adding extra propositions or by adding uh, evidence into the models. But here we are trying to talk about like super abstract structure of, of the inference. Um, I can point you to papers that try that with all sorts of context if you're interested. Okay, so now 
we are uh, back on track. So now you know more or less what this modelings of knowledge do. So they are trying to extend probability in a way. So you can, you can think of epistemic logic as a symbolic version. So, you know, you have certain probability distribution between uh, options. What you could think of is that this is just an order of possible worlds for the agent. Right? So agent preferred certain worlds over other worlds. And in our case, it's just flat. I mean, all the worlds are just equally plausible. And what we do on top of that is that we involve other agents inside of this space, right? So you can reason about knowledge or lack of knowledge of other agents. Uh, in order to connect these two fields, I will actually flatten it down again to one agent, and I will show you how to start, and then I will show you uh, how to continue through uh, papers in the bibliography. Okay, so this is the rough plan. I don't know if I will be able to cover everything, but uh, I'll do my best. So first we will discuss a little bit this knowledge update and belief revision policies that lie at the uh, root of all this dynamic epistemic mo mo uh, modeling. Uh, then I will tell you a little bit about learning via belief revision. Uh, and I will show you results that try to, uh, that try to we try to think of this update procedures in epistemic logic as learning methods. So we want to not only know that they are intuitive or they satisfy certain axioms, but also that they are reliable as learning methods. Right? And that's kind of interesting because these things are used all over the place, like in game theory, decision theory, in economics. There are a lot of weird uh, low-level procedures assuming how agents act that are supposed to have some long-term effects. So it's interesting to know what are the reliability constraints on those. And then I will try to move to topology. So I will show you uh, the generalization of learning, which is called solving. And uh, we will analyze it in topology. And finally, I will uh, give you a short round through interpretations of different model logics for topological setting. And uh, we will try to see if uh, there is a certain uh, angle to treating epistemic logic for learnability. And actually, we already have a paper on this, but it's just under review right now. So we'll see how it goes. So let's start. In computer science, uh, we it started all with updating databases, right? And I guess uh, how many of you are familiar with database? Um, yeah, that's who should. That's actually up the alley of the school. So in computer science, we have this problem: it's a database, incoming information. What do you do with it? There should be certain axioms that are satisfied, perhaps, of this update. There should be certain uh, computational constraints uh, that are satisfied. In philosophy, uh, it's also a big uh, thing because, first of all, we have a philosophy of science in which we want to study how scientific theories get revised. How do we drop certain paradigm and get a new one? In machine learning or whatever, astronomy. Uh, what are the necessary conditions to drop a theory? And how do we build a new one? And in belief change, uh, and here it's a very prominent framework in philosophy, we are concerned with the uh, rationality of belief revision. So if you consider an agent revising beliefs, uh, for instance, reading information on Facebook and revising beliefs about whom to vote for in the next election, um, it would be nice to understand what goes into rationality constraints of such behavior. Right? So is there any logical way to grasp how, what kind of properties should be satisfied? So this is the rough formalism for this. We have certain belief set or belief base. There is a new information coming in and we are switching to the new belief state, right? We are interested in this. How does this actually work? And for instance, you have an AGM framework that would uh, Alturon, Gardenforce and Mackinson, three guys, a very standard framework for belief revision, uh, axioms that tell you exactly what kind of postulates should such procedure satisfy. So for instance, it should be closed on consequence. Right? So if I, first I, I have a belief set, I get uh, new information, I should close after revising, when I have a revised state, I should close it on all the consequences. Right? Because otherwise I'm inconsistent as a, as a believer. Success, if I hear P, my new belief, uh, set should satisfy P, should include P. I should, I should adopt this new information, perhaps, right? Inclusion, vacuity, <coughs> consistency, extensionality, super expansion, and sub-expansion. This is a standard set of axioms that you would put on belief revision. 
and they are studied back and forth in all sorts of places, also in knowledge representation. Um, they are a little bit of an armchair philosophy, right? I mean, you sit down and you think, yeah, the inclusion simply means that if I were just a dumb agent, take my belief set and add the P on top, even if it's inconsistent, I just add it, right? Then whatever is here, it should be actually a subset. It should, whatever is in act, my actual way that I revise uh, should be a subset of this set. Uh, here the tricky part is that very often your incoming information will be inconsistent with your beliefs. So you have to run a certain procedure for your logic, like for your knowledge, to eliminate this inconsistency, right? So it will, this will not be the same as this. So in, uh, in the literature you have a lot of uh, approaches to this uh, knowledge and belief representation. So you have AGM, which is uh, those axioms, onion models that are trying to represent agents' knowledge as like concentric circles. So whatever is in the middle is the, the most believed part and then you have like less and less uh, plausible uh, elements. And finally, it goes all the way to plausibility spaces, which is the framework that I'm using. And it's very close to the possible world models that we considered before. Right, so all these ways of thinking can be actually translated into uh, the plausibility spaces. So let us consider an example. So, here, I'm, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to use the same way of thinking that was in the first part of the lecture today, but I'm switching it around. So instead of thinking of my hypothesis as sets of evidence, I'm thinking of evidence as sets of hypotheses. Okay? So here we have a, like in the Madi children case, we have, a we have a set of possibilities and they satisfy certain propositions. So, for instance, these two hypotheses, they're consistent with observing P1, right? They make the P1 true. So, it's a bit like, for instance, two sets that contain number one, and the number one would be the observation that I'm making. It's like a dual perspective on things. It would be consistent with model logic. Uh, so, now, uh, I will call it an epistemic space, and it consists uh, of a state space and a family of observables. Um, now, those are called observable properties. So for instance, I can ask uh, different types about this epistemic space. This is something that is just is my uncertainty range. I don't know which of this hypothesis is true, but I know which propositions, observing which propositions would make me choose one over another. Right? So for instance, if I observe P2, then those uh, hypotheses remain as consistent with my observed information. Logically speaking, I could also ask the question, is um, put some sort of um, partition on my set and say uh, phi or not phi, right? And upon observing certain propositions about my possible worlds, I should be able to decide whether my actual world is on one side or on the other side of this uh, partition. Okay. So what we have in this picture is my uncertainty range, the evidence that I could observe about those hypothesis spaces, so sequences of observations, and on top of it I have a question, like something that I want to answer, solve. Right, is this clear, more or less? Of course, I can have uh, more complex uh, questions that I want to ask, sometimes they are, um, they can be even uh, covers, they don't have to be partitions. A limit case would be uh, identifiability in the limit. So if I have, if my question is so refined that I am actually asking about the identity of the world, then I end up with the identifiability question that we had before. Right? So I, I really want to identify which hypothesis is the one in question. Okay, so uh, what I consider in this framework is that uh, we basically take an epistemic space and a set of states and observables, and now a data stream, so this text that I considered before, will be just an infinite sequence of observations uh, that are consistent with my state, with the state that is the actual world. So we will say that it's sound with respect to a state if all the observations listed in this stream are true in S, and it's complete if um, it doesn't, if it enumerates everything that is true, right? So, I mean, with respect to logical closure. So now my uh, observation streams will be like that. 
So again, the identifiability question in this new framework is as follows. So now a learning function will not be this function from numbers to numbers, but it will be a learner, like in the case of Madi children, it will be a learner that on the starting point of the actual epistemic space that they have, the uncertainty range, and the initial segment of the incoming information, it will output some subset of the space. Some sort of hypothesis, a proposition, something that is supposed to tell us where he is within this framework. Uh, we will say that the world S is identified in the limit by a learning method L if for every sound and complete data stream for S there exists a finite stage after which L outputs the singleton S from then on. Right? So it answers all sorts of propositions, but then it narrows it down to this one particular case, like in the case of Madi children, and after some time we're just stabilizing on a single hypothesis. And obviously we want to extend it just in the case of identifiable in the limit to make it bulletproof, so we also want the whole space to be identified in the limit, and we also want uh, the existence of a learner if we want to talk about identifiability. So let's look at an example. So let's see that, uh, say that this is our epistemic space, and uh, actually what is the case is that this is the actual world. All kids are muddy, or uh, it's a set of numbers containing everything but three, some sort of hypothesis that describes our world in the end. Um, so now what happens here? Uh, what we are allowed to observe in this framework is we are allowed to observe observables that, make, that are true in this possible world. Which observable is true in the red world? P2, right? So let's say we observe P2. Upon observing P2, we are able to eliminate those, right? So we, we learned by elimination. Now we are stuck within this new epistemic space, like one of these mother kids. Uh, there is something to be done, right? Is there anything else that I could do here? Which one? Uh, th this this is just uh, possible. Yeah, I could remove them. They are they are empty now. So yeah, they are not there really. Really good question, yeah. Not at this point yet, but perhaps I could in the long run. I can't, so for instance, if I could observe not P5, right, then I could eliminate this world, right? But I can't because it's restricted to sound and complete data. Yeah, nothing else, right? Of course, it's a simplified example. You would have more other observations, but I'm stuck. So um, if I had something like this, that would be cool, right? A little observation that just, says, this is the world, right? I mean, it's just the one that, uh, yeah, then I could eliminate the others. Um, my pointer doesn't work again. I could eliminate those and I'm fine. Is there any other remedy to this problem? And instead of elimination, perhaps I could have some more clever simplicity related solution to this problem. Perhaps instead of thinking that all those hypotheses are equally plausible, I could also have an order on them, right? Have some sort of simplicity order that is driven by the way that the problem is posed, right? So, yeah? Yeah. I don't know if you heard what he said, but indeed there should be certain way, so, if I stick to this guy, right, I'm kind of sure that at some point, if, if it's not this guy, I will see P4 for this one, or P5 even for this one, right? So it makes sense in the spirit of identifying the limit to stick to this hypothesis as long as possible. So now the idea would be that this problem drives us to this particular order on the hypothesis, right? That I should have not perhaps had all of those equally plausible, but perhaps some of them should be more plausible than others, but not because of what I saw, but because of the structure of the problem. Right? So uh, I'm going to introduce this uh, order. Yeah. Why P5 directed to P4? I mean, why, why this wall directed to P4? They seem to be just equivalent. Yeah, that's true because they have the separation uh, of, they're separated by those. I think it's because uh, initially the picture probably was like this. 
Uh, so this P4 was actually taking this one. And then you understand that it would have to be, yeah. But we will see another example. But it doesn't really matter in this context because even if there is this order, you will eliminate the hypothesis if you see so. Yeah. This one should, this one could not be the most plausible one because if um, if this is the actual world and we stick to this as the most plausible, then we will never see evidence that falsifies our assumption. Yeah, the rest is yeah, yeah. In this particular case, yes. Okay, so now. What I did is I went through the muddy children type of modeling to something more advanced. I hope you see that in muddy children what we had is that the all worlds were equally plausible because we had this equivalence relation. So if you look at the single agent, it's just like a bag of worlds. I have many possibilities that are equally likely. I like them the same amount. And here what I said, on top of this, I put a plausibility relation, something that directs me to the most plausible worlds given my learning problem. So this is what I call plausibility space, and it consists of, again, this epistemic space as before, but also on top of it, I have this uh, a plausibility preorder, right? So it, it will order my worlds uh, in a way that I like. And now within this framework, we can still retrieve this model logic operators of knowledge and belief. So what we can basically say that in my plausibility space, and here uh, I call it actually BS, sorry, um, should be BS. Um, it satisfies, no, the agent knows that P, if P is true in all worlds that are in my space. And it's the same as we would think in terms of model logic, to all accessible worlds, all accessible worlds from my state are uh, satisfying P. And uh, then the belief is interpreted in a bit weaker way, or stronger, depending how you think of it, um, B, uh, BS satisfies the agent believes in P if P is true in all minimal worlds according to the, pre, to the order, right? So whatever my, uh, my plausibility relation points to, those are the things that I believe. I cannot exclude that it's not the case, the other, the not P, but I believe P because the most plausible worlds satisfy P. And this is a very standard way of modeling belief in the Sastic logic. Uh, where we actually look at uh, this combination of two factors. And sometimes, if you are very stubborn and you are a mathematician and you want to have infinite structures, this minimum will not be there sometimes. And those are actually quite crucial elements for us in this talk, uh, cases. Uh, then we get this limiting condition. Okay, let's say that I don't have the most plausible. It gets more and more and more and more plausible. I have like this open-ended plausibility relation then there should exist a point after which whatever is more plausible satisfies P. Right, so from some point on I have this infinite tail and P is true everywhere. And that's what I would call belief. Uh, so we have those two cases depending on uh, well-foundedness in the situation. Now in this framework, what is a belief revision method? I mean, we, we talked a little bit about what belief, it was this method that you, you have a belief state, you get a new uh, piece of information, you revise your belief state. Now a belief revision method is a function that for any plausibility space, so for any structure of this type with the order on it, um, and any data sequence, finite sequence, uh, it actually outputs a new plausibility space. So it's not like a learning method. Learning method takes epistemic space, information, and outputs a proposition. And this is constructive. This says, give me um, an element uh, that I have to uh, consider and I will do a new plausibility space. So I will, it's like an engine inside of the learning map. What kind of belief revisions are the most, uh, belief revision methods are the most uh, popular? So first of all, we have this uh, conditioning, delete. Bayesian learning works like this, right? We zero the stuff that doesn't conform to our, we just get it out. What is the condition for the pro proper treatment of such situations? You have to trust the source. Right? I mean, if you zero the, I mean, no surprise, right? I mean, no, no lying. 
If you think in terms of uh, multi-agent situations, the situation in which you receive false information, this happens all the time, right? You can't really trust your source uh, really deeply. And here is something that actually is considered very much in game theory, uh, but also in decision theory and other places, uh, lexicographic upgrade. And lexicographic up upgrade works like this. I hope you can see this. I changed computers, so I found it impossible to embed in the slides. But so this is the plausibility space. Simplify just simple case. Something happens, and now Q comes in, and I take all the words that satisfies Q, and I put them on top. P comes in, I put them on top, and I preserve the order. Right? You. Right? Clear? So now, uh, in our learning scenario, this would mean that I learn not only by elimination, but because I'm concerned with the minimal words, the most plausible words, I can also reshuffle. It's a bit like changing the probability distribution or whatever, right? So you can, and this is uh, great, but imagine the computational cost of this operation. You have to go through the whole space, retrieve the states that satisfy, pick them up, put them on top, right? It even seems like physically seems heavy, right? It's a lot of work. Um, so then people thought minimal revision would be better. And it's also, again, game theory, decision theory, uh, logic, uh, belief revision. And minimal, sorry for the inconsistency in presentation, but uh, this is what it looks like. So again, we have a plausibility space. P comes in. I take the most plausible P world and I put it on top. Most plausible Q world and I put it on top. And again, these are the ways to think about those things without actually looking deep into numbers. It's just symbolic, right? We talk about orders, we talk about logical operators. It's nothing more than that. Um, my time is until 1.30 or? So the other one rearranges the pre-order by making only the most plausible state satisfying P more plausible than all the others, leaving the rest of the pre-order the same. And here I would like to maybe refer to Johan van Bentham and his uh, dynamic logic for belief revision in which he is actually formalizing in a sense of these dynamic operators that I discussed before, this type of adjustments of uh, belief states. I don't want to say learning methods because those are not learning methods. Those are, those are methods for updating. Those are methods for change. But the learning part, which supposed to have some sort of condition that it actually, in the long run, makes sense that you actually learn something that you're supposed to be learning. That's another issue. And this is what I would like to discuss here now. So learning via belief revision. So now what we want to do, we want to take these belief revision methods, plug them into the learning method, and see how the learning method does on the learning problem, right? whether it's universal or not. So game theory, artificial intelligence, epistemic logic, belief revision, equip agents with methods that allow them to change their beliefs and conjectures, database, knowledge uh, uh, components on the basis of new information. Learning theory can answer the question, how good are those strategies in the long run with respect to what criteria should they be evaluated? So we are, we are asking the question of reliability. If we put this belief revision methods to learn something, would they learn as much as it's learnable by any other method? So formally, this would look like this. I would, I would just plug in my revision method inside of my learning method. So I, I define the learning method driven by the revision method and the plausibility order on a state with an information sequence to output the minimal states in the new plausibility space that results from uh, this update. Right? So as a result, this is a learning method because it outputs a bunch of states, but its, its engine is working via uh, revision policy. It's a little bit like universal Turing machine. You can put other program, other Turing machine on it. It will just do the job, right? So here we want to have um, a learning method that is driven by, by this uh, revision method. So now we will say that an epistemic space uh, or a plausibility space, I, I don't, uh, epistemic space is identified in the limit by a belief revision method if there exists a prior plausibility assignment, so some order on the hypothesis, on the possible worlds, such that the generated learning method identifies it in the limit. And this is what we did in the examples in the first part of the lecture. 
right? We were kind of thinking of learning algorithms that learn a certain problem, but underneath we were also thinking about the plausibility order of the hypothesis. So you remember with this finite sets, we're thinking what would be the way to consider them in certain order, right? And this is where this ordering comes in handy. We will say that the learning method L is universal if it can identify in the limit every epistemic space that is in general identifiable in the limit. So whatever he could come up with as a learning method, because he is really good at it, uh, the learning method, the minimal revision, for instance, should be also able to cope with as, a, as an engine, right? That would be the question that we want to ask. And the results. I won't go, through, of course, through the proofs for you here. Uh, some of them are quite easy, but they're all published, so you can, you can have a look. Uh, so conditioning and lexicographic revision are universal. So indeed, you can learn whatever you can learn with, uh, with our framework. Uh, you can learn with, uh, but there is, there, is a, there is a but, so don't worry. Uh, lexicographic, yes. Minimal revision is not universal. And it's not universal because it only scratches the surface of your plausibility space. Whenever you have incoming information, it just goes all the way to the first one, and then it puts it on top. So we can imagine certain uh, information distributions in which it will lead to a cycle on top of the uh, plausibility space and you won't be able to reach the worlds that are deeper in the structure. But what is interesting, also from a Bayesian perspective of on learning, is that no universal belief revision method exists for well-founded pre-orders. So if you restrict your learning, your, your plausibility space, to well-founded structures, so you always have the minimum, you will not be able to learn as much as identifiability in the limit is able to learn. And this is where Popper measures. How many of you know what Popper measures are? Nobody. Oh, but that's maybe good. <laughs> it's mind-blowing. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, let's see the example. So here we have the example of uh, this structure that we actually... Uh, talked about before. Mm, yeah. Okay, so uh, I mentioned the structure in the set theoretic, but we didn't talk about it. In the, so now we have hypotheses are the dots, remember, right? So those are hypotheses. Now, this hypothesis is consistent with infinitely many observations. So this is like the set of all natural numbers. This is all natural numbers except for, let's say, zero. This is all natural numbers except for zero and one. This is all natural numbers except zero. So they are co-initial segment uh, natural numbers. Now, in order to learn this structure, if you would have to think about the simplicity order that you have to put on the hypothesis to learn this, you have to start with, with that, right? Because you are actually, you wait for the first evidence and you cut off the infinite tail at the first step, right? So this shows that um, the plausibility cannot be, for achieving the full power of learning method, we cannot restrict our notion of belief to this well-founded structure as people do in game theory, decision theory, and uh, artificial intelligence. It requires a little bit more uh, like conscious uh, probabilistic and uh, logical uh, attention, like what you're actually doing with those methods. And given then th uh, that the minimal revision is actually postulated in, in the literature on the practical aspects as one of the most plausible, feasible, best methods, no wonder, because it doesn't do the job. I mean, it doesn't learn. It can be easy, but yeah. Uh, we can close our information dynamics also on negation closed spaces. And it was suggested in one of the examples. So you might not only consider positive information, but also negative information. So I could tell you, no, two is not in the set. Right? So it's not only that I enumerate positive instances. But then you would think something like supervised learning, in which you can actually have the labels uh, and you, you can treat them in a more uh, informative way. Of course, then you need more language to your information flow because then maybe propositional logic is a good uh, way because you just have the information or the negation of the information and it can have semantic interpretation. So in such case, for instance, we would be able to observe P, but also we would be able to observe another observation that is the complement of P with a certain marker that it's, uh, that it's the negative observation. 
And then, of course, it points to lexicographic revision as the most friendly one. Um, uh, because on uh, the first themes, and first themes are the ones that make some mistakes, but only finitely many. So it's like sort of as far as you can kind of get with errors with logic, right? So you can assume that your uh, infinite stream has finitely many wrong, noisy pieces of information that don't conform to the truth postulates. And obviously conditioning will not work anymore because conditioning eliminates everything that is that you hear, right? So you can't recover from that. But lexicographic allows you to keep the memory, uh, keep the states that uh, were there in the memory. And of course, there is a whole range of things in between, right? Uh, you can consider them, uh, but it's not for this lecture. So now the topological part. Um, what we want to do is to think of these observables the sets of states on some sort of topological uh, level, which is suited for talking about spaces in general. How many of you know topology? I wonder what you mean by knowing topology. I don't know what you mean by that. <laughs> no, but you answered so eagerly, so. Okay. I just stuck my hand up. Okay. It was easy. Um, okay. Um, I will introduce a little bit of these notions, but. The main hook here is that um, observability and open sets in topology, they were connected at some point. Um, so there's the Stephen Vickers book, uh, Topology via Logic, in which he's uh, very clearly connecting open sets uh, to observations about the true states of affairs in the states themselves. And uh, this turned out to be extremely useful for us uh, as a metaphor. Uh, I will show you um, what we do here. So now what we want to do, we want to take a step back, go away from uh, the questions of belief revision, but think in more general terms. What would be a topological characterization of learnability? Is there a topological counterpart of these spaces that we consider learnable? And now we have them in the right representation because now we, we have them as sets of hypotheses being validated by evidence. So we want to treat learnability and solvability of questions in terms of topological separation properties. Uh, and we want to see if we can actually use some constructive methods to do that and uh, try to draw some consequences for logic uh, of belief um, or logic of knowledge, so dynamic abstaining. So what do I mean by uh, learning and solving? So again, epistemic space as before, we have a bunch of states, we have observables, uh, true in some of those states, right? And we have a data stream that just enumerates observations of so these big sets in the model, uh, sound and complete observations. Uh, and the learner is again defined in the same way as before. So the learner takes the space, the string of information outputs a conjecture, and we are aiming at them answering with the singleton answer in the case of identifiability in the limit. Right? So after some time, the learner should know which is the actual state. A little bit like in the Maddy children's situation. An example, just to uh, get us started. Um, so now we have, uh, again, this uh, structure that we studied that uh, is supposed to be non-well-founded in the beginning. So it's a set of hypotheses, all natural numbers, all except zero, all except zero, one, all except zero, one, three, and so on. This is uh, our epistemic space for the representation of this states. Now let's say that I uh, hear P2. What should I do as a learner? If you understood the non well founded comment before, you should know which one to point to. S3, yes. So, this observation allows me to disregard everything there, right? So, all this infinite tail does, but am I allowed to make some statements about those inside? We received just P2. Number number two. So it's like before, only we have it now in the model model logic uh, semantics. Let's just say, right? So we switch the perspective, and now 
those dots are actually not natural numbers, they are hypotheses, right, that we consider. And now we receive the number two. Uh, which of those should be my guess for the learning procedure? To work. So the point is to get two t means that it's not as long as two, or would it be any one that yeah. two? Yes, and now within this, we should make a change. Who thinks it should be a zero? Nobody, that's good, because this would be wrong. Um, S2 should be the hypothesis. And this comes from, first of all, from our considerations from before, but also from the fact that this structure begs this non well founded order, right? That those become more and more, more plausible. And then what, what, what it does is that upon receiving the first observation, I'm actually able to eliminate the infinite tail and just stand, stay to this one. And now this allows me to have this ne very neat temporary assumption because if it's S2, I will never receive a contradictory information, so I will stay in S2 forever. But if it's not S2, then I will receive P1, which will point me here via this initial uh, order, or it will get me all the way down. Right, let's see uh, for this one. Right, so this is something that is not learnable. Again, uh, this set contains uh, number zero. Uh, uh, yeah, so this is a zero, this is zero one, zero one two, zero one two three, and this one is the set of all natural numbers. So this is basically the gold theorem's counterpart treated in this uh, topological uh, setting. So we have a set of observables, and we are basically unable to reach this state. And this is because, intuitively, if you think about it, it's because we are lacking some sort of separation property. And right? we cannot separate this world from all the others by a finite amount of information, right? Okay. Is there a question? No. Right, so for instance, if we receive this one, we could stick to this, but then if we choose this type of learning procedure, we will just stand in this like infinite tail, never getting to the uh, S, uh, 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 S infinity, Right? So for instance, here we will choose S2 and then so on, but actually we will never reach this one if it's the case. Okay. So this one, those were this, uh, again, learnability constraints on my uh, epistemic spaces. Um, now what I want to do is that I can actually do even more with this. So I might not be concerned with the actual identity of the world, but I might be interested in some more abstract partition of the space. So I just want some general question to be answered. If I'm in this scope or in that scope, is phi true or is phi not true? So then a question will be a partition of such a space and those cells of the question will be answers to this question. The question can be binary, can we have two answers? Yes, no, it can have many answers. Uh, now, given a state, um, we will denote this to be the true answer to the question in the state. Now, questions can be refined. You can have a general question, but you can also refine your question as much as you want, given your uh, computability constraints, to be uh, even more refined partition. And the problem overall, like logically speaking, the problem will be a pair that is an epistemic space together with this question. Right? So I have my atomic possibilities being the worlds, I have observations, evidence inside of the model, and I have my question. This is the problem. Right, so you have all the observability constraints inside. We can also refine problems. An example, this is a problem. It's an epistemic space, consists of four worlds. Uh, I know what I can observe in each of those worlds. I'm waiting for this observation to happen. And my question is, boom. I want to know if I'm on this side or on that side of the order. Right? And this will be a refinement of this problem. And actually, I refined so much now that I ended up in the identifiability question. So now, if I answer this question, I will actually identify because each of the partition consists only of the singleton world. And again, learning method solves a problem in the limit. If for every state and every data stream, what we have that after a finite amount of steps, we will end up with an answer being included in the answer answer, in the proper answer to the question. So this is a generalization of the learning problem. Instead of talking about learning particular world, we are looking at the solutions. So we, are, we want to solve them. A problem is solvable in the limit if there is a learner that solves it in the limit. Okay, doc. Um, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, um, the assumption is that the observation is truthful. So uh, uh, in principle, yes. In principle, we can, we can assume that. Uh, but uh, since the learner tries to be consistent with the observation most of the time, uh, then uh, there will be always the actual world being consistent with the, with the observation, right? So it will be always at least this world. Uh, but obviously, I mean, you can define a crazy learning method that just doesn't care, right? And outputs. It's not mathematically excluded. Topological toolbox. So how can we talk about these things topologically? And this will lead us to actually <coughs> characterizing what is learnable in terms of topological notions. What is a topology? Uh, topology tau over a set S is a collection of subsets such that an empty set is part of this uh, topology, a full set is uh, part of this topology, arbitrary unions are part of the topology, and for any finite, uh, any finite conjunction, so any finite intersection of uh, things is in the topology. Right, and then we have extra notions for you to perhaps uh, study uh, in the afternoon, um, the interior and uh, the interior is just, uh, yeah, the union of all the opens that uh, include the set. That are included in this, that, inclu that are included in the set. Now the subset is closed uh, if uh, its complement is open and uh, the closure is defined as the intersection of uh, the, op the complements of opens that include the set. Okay, those are like standard notions that make a lot of sense in different contexts. Um, what we said in the case of uh, this uh, complicated, non-learnable cases is that what was missing was some sort of separation property. Some observations that will allow us to distinguish the infinite set from the finite set, for any finite set, right? So intuitively in topology you would say that probably it has something to do about separation properties. In topology they are studied quite a lot uh, because they allow you to say about points, like how they are separated uh, with respect to the observables, uh, open sets. So in topology, uh, we have the condition of T1, which means uh, that the set is strongly separated. Just if every set, uh, every state S is separable from every other state in S. Uh, so for all pairs, if they are different, then there is an observation such that, the, the proposition that you can observe such that it includes one state but doesn't include the other. Uh, topology tau over S is T0, weakly separated, if all distinct states are separable one way or the other. Okay, so let's see what this means. Here, in this space, T and U are not separable. There is no information that you can obtain that will allow you to distinguish which state is the one, because they satisfy the same stuff. Okay. This space is weakly separated, because for this state, you can find observation that does not include this state, but not the other way around. This state will always leave you in the dark. Like if you, right, it's, it's not separated the other way. And this is a strongly separated space, T1. And it is a space which, for which, for any observation, you can find stuff one way or the other. Um, so now, we can define a sort of different types of separation via uh, considering different relationships between these open sets in our topology. So a set A is locally closed uh, if uh, it's a union of, uh, if it's an intersection of a set that is open and is closed, uh, which basically means that the set is closed with respect to some open, right, that is relevant for it. A set is constructible, and this is our own notion, uh, if it's a finite disjoint, no, sorry, it's omega uh, constructible. I will, con uh, constructible if it's a finite disjoint union of locally closed sets. Um, a special type of condition that is actually already available in topology is uh, the so-called TD separation property that basically tells you that um, you always have this for every state, it's a complement of an open within another open. So you have like this sort of, if I take a state, I know that there will be an observation that will allow me to exclude it, which sounds dangerously close or friendly close to what we want, right? Because you, you remember these pictures that I drew, they had this structure of this one state being left after any observation in the order. 
And this property is actually uh, sits between T0 and T1. So it's actually something that uh, is considered in topology as, as a kind of a, a condition in between those two states. But it's just, it's just so. Yeah. And now just for, uh, for uh, clarity, an omega constructible set is a countable union of locally closed sets. And every omega constructible set is a disjoint countable union of locally closed sets. This is just to extend our notion of uh, notion of constructibility to the infinite cases which we study in our work. It will become a little bit more uh, feasible now. Okay, so now what we can do, simply we can think of our epistemic spaces as this topology is to be, something that aspires to be a topology. Right? Because of course they, they might not satisfy these properties from the beginning, but why not? Maybe it should. Let's see how it would go. So we have an epistemic space, and now we would like to say that the agent can observe the full set because it's open. It should be open, right? The full set should be part of the topology. Is it okay from the perspective of learning to observe the full space? It is because it carries no information. It's like saying one of those, right? It's, it's what the agent knows anyway, right? Because they have this uh, uncertainty range. Then arbitrary unions, arbitrary disjunctions. For the same reason, it's okay. Because disjunction doesn't carry much more information than what you already have. It just tells you, okay, within this bunch, your world is there, right? And finite conjunctions is simply, if you look at the sequence, like cumulative sequence of information, each of the initial segment will be, can be treated as a conjunction of information from your space. So as a result, what we can do, we can close, we can think of any epistemic space as a topology by closing it on these operations. Okay, so whatever intersections you have, you also can observe them by a conjunction of observations. Whatever is a, a full set, you can observe it via arbitrary disjunction operation. Okay, so here we go from uh, epistemic spaces to topologies. We call it um, a topology associated with an epistemic space. Okay, so characterizations. Again, proofs are available uh, in the full version of the paper, but the theorem. A problem P is solvable in the limit if the question has a countable locally closed refinement. So, Problem consists of a state space and a question, some question, and now what we sometimes have to do, we cannot answer the question directly, but we have to refine it. So we have to make it a little bit more refined, and then we will be able to solve the original uh, problem via the refinement. Uh, and this ref refinement should be countable, locally closed, uh, we should satisfy this condition. Now the epistemic space uh, is learnable in the limit if it's countable and satisfies the TD separation action. So actually, we were able to you know, figure out the topological characterization via uh, an existing property in topology, which is nice, because very often the applied uh, research, it, it creates new notions for a discipline, right? So when you go to the topologist, uh, they will say like, why well, you just invented something, I don't know what this means. But if you tell them, I want to study TD because it's relevant for my uh, considerations, they say, ah, I can tell you like 100 million facts about this TD space, right? Maybe one of them will be relevant for you. So this was pretty nice to find this. Um, one question that you might ask is, okay, uh, how does, do the solvability methods work? And um, you might think that you can again learn via order of answers. So before we learned via order of uh, states, and now we say, okay, maybe I can order the answers and then have similar result that I can actually find this plausibility order on higher level uh, problems. Uh, and this is important because in belief revision, computational learning theory, uh, in philosophy of science, this question of this order is always there. So it's sort of simplicity order or uh, complexity uh, order or in co-learning or learning by erasing, you look at the indices of Turing machines and you look for the minimal ones. So there's always some order underneath. Um, yes, so this is just a repetition of the previous one. So now what we would actually uh, want is that we would, we would want to have this um, canonical order on the answers, right? That 
if the states are in a certain order, then the answers that they correspond to are also can be also ordered in the following way. So we will say that the problem is directly solvable by eliminating possibilities if it's solvable with respect to some total order on the answers. And it's actually not the case. So for instance, here in this example, we can see that I could, for instance, say that, okay, I order A1 to be more plausible than A2. But let's say that this is actually my actual world. Right? I will never see an observation that falsifies A1. Right? So I will always stay within this. And since this is the order on the answers, it will never allow me to get out of this. So what is, what is the answer? The answer is to define the question so that it follows more of the actual structure of the problem. Right? And this is what we mean by those refinements. And they just become kind of elaborate and complicated in the infinite cases because it's not always going to be an identifiability question. But yeah. Um, and this direct solvability basically corresponds to a new condition uh, that is called linear separability, which, uh, just, which is very similar to the TD condition, only it goes on the level of answers. So for those of you that are interested in uh, topology, you should be able to. And for your interest, this is the strategy of the proof. Conditioning, so removing a possibility is a universal problem solving method. Not all solvable problems allow direct solvability as we saw in this example. So we, transfer, we can transform them into directly solvable refinements. And which ones do? The linear is separated. So then this implies that and we are there. Again, I encourage you to look into the literature. Okay, so um, the final part. Um, it's very difficult with this type of lectures because the audience is varied. So sorry for the last 20 minutes, but this is for those of you who are uh, interested in following up with the research level with this stuff. And now we will go kind of level in, in between. Um, we would like to have logic for all this stuff, right? So have, as we had this dynamic epistemic logic in which we had learners and operators and dynamic changes of epistemic states, perhaps it would be nice to have also a logical counterpart to this topological perspective on learning. And uh, as it happens, there is something called topological semantics for model logic, which interprets uh, model logic not on these graphs like nodes with explicit arrows, but on topological spaces. Um, so let's see at the semantics. Normally we would have box phi, which is the same as k that I discussed before. It's, it should opali, it's opalizing, it's between box and k is the same thing. For all uh, edge, for all vertices in my graph that are related, phi holds. This was the original definition. So now in order to go to topology, now those were the axioms, so uh, the axioms that corresponded to S5, uh, they kind of gave you all sorts of consequences for the type of knowledge that you would consider. We discussed that in detail. And we had completeness results overall. So how these things are bound is via having a complete logic that describes everything that is valid within this framework. What is the difference? So now what we say to be the box phi is the interior. So whatever is true, let's say in the open around, I will show you the definition, it's actually, then the, if phi is satisfied in the whole of this open set, then box phi is satisfied at the state. Before, this was the interpretation. We had some graph and we were able to reach the other nodes and then phi was supposed to be true in those states. Now, this is a little bit more bloody, right? It's, uh, it's kind of spreads over the space. And this allows, uh, of course, to consider more uh, refined uh, techniques also for continu uh, continuous stuff. <coughs> okay? So we have, again, a set of propositional symbols, a topological model or a topo model, M, is a topological space as before, so a set of states together with observables like our epistemic space. And then we have some valuation function. Um, and now uh, the definition is as follows. So a box phi is true at the state. If there is an uh, U in the topology, an open set, um, such that the state that I evaluate with 
belongs to this U, to this open set. And for all other states in this open, I have that phi satisfies in those states. But this really is the consistency with an observation, right? So box phi is like this thing is consistent with the observation phi. Um, yeah. And now again, we can see like, under this interpretation of box, what consequences do we have for our uh, logic of knowledge? So we start with S5, and we know all sorts of things. For instance, we know that topologic, by the result of McKinsey and Tarski from 44, corresponds to S4. Right? And then now we can see those axioms, they are actually they have some sort of knowledge representation, like an epistemic representation, and then maybe this would be a good logic for knowledge, a uh, logic for learning, because it satisfies similar axioms. We can also change the view of the way we view box and not think about all the space, but all the space except for the actual state that we are in. So this kind of challenges the truthfulness of your belief in, in uh, the factual component of your uh, knowledge. And then obviously we would have to change the interpretation of the box under this interpretation and now we have to dig through the literature on topological semantics and see what corresponds to what. For instance, we have that KD45 is something that is called DSO space. This is already on the market, available. Uh, Grzegorczyk logic axiom from model logic, it corresponds to scattered spaces, also available. Um, Weak K4 uh, is a topo uh, logic uh, axiomatization. I think it's the result uh, is quite recent. And finally, we find K4. K4 is the TD. Uh, it characterizes TD. So this type of knowledge should have something to do with our learnability constraints. Um, Okie doke. And um, we are in competition with other people who claim that they actually do have uh, learning adequate or dynamic adequate a notion of, um, of uh, topological knowledge, and those would be DSO spaces, but um, derived sets are open, but then uh, TD spaces, um, DSO are TD spaces, but not all TD spaces are DSO. So it, it also brings an interesting question, what is it about this uh, operators, model operators, that uh, distinguishes the two cases? Okay, so conclusions. Um, I gave you topological characterizations of learnability and solvability in the limit. Uh, I gave you a universality of conditioning as a problem solving method, uh, zeroing the uh, stuff that is false. Uh, and we use stratification like topological techniques. If you Google them, uh, should be enough to know quite a lot. More learnable spaces are TD uh, and so on. What is interesting is also the fact that we consider this non-well-founded space as essential for reaching the full space of uh, learnability. And that's something I would like to draw your attention to. And now since I'm just exactly in time, uh, I will show you the bibliography. So uh, this is a little bit self-centered because it would be really huge to build like the body of slides uh, for telling you what you should read in order to understand this stuff better. Those are papers that I co-authored most of them, I think not, not all of them, I think. So here you have bibliography for the general stuff, like how to draw connections between these two things, model logic of knowledge and learning. And there is a perspective uh, a little bit uh, coming from complexity theory, and this is joint work with Dick De Jong, who is an expert in model logic, so uh, we had a very nice collaboration there. We also have something related to uh, automata theory. It was in the LATA workshop. And there's also my PhD thesis, which is, of course, uh, it was a long time ago. And, uh, you know, like, but it's a book. So you can read it with an introduction. Uh, it, it helps a bit. Uh, then there is a whole uh, program of this uh, uh, universality topology and logical languages. Uh, and what I would like to, so this is what I discussed in the slides, but this is new. Uh, this is something that is just published as a proceedings paper, but now we, we just uh, submitted the final version. And uh, it's actually a logic which dynamically involves a learner inside of the language. 
So we have a modality that says the learner answers pi to a certain learning problem. And we have a sound and complete, fingers crossed, if the reviewers don't find a mistake, uh, sound and complete logic for learnability in this context. And finally, uh, you remember I showed you this dynamic epistemic logic um, uh, model in which we had this coin under a cup. So what we are also working on is trying to figure out how to learn these action models. So from executions of actions, epistemic actions or propositional actions, to figure out what is the internal structure of the action model. And uh, uh, together with Thomas Boland in my university, we worked on, uh, on this uh, qualitative learning of uh, action models. And now with uh, Andres, who should be asked all the questions related to that, uh, he's over there. Um, we are working on an overview paper uh, together to try to connect what we are doing with other action learning models. Thank you very much for your attention, time and patience.